Most Americans are unaware of the unique political status held by American Indian tribes and the special relationship that exists between tribes and the United States government. The concept of sovereignty is the foundation upon which this status and this relationship are built. In this program, we'll investigate some of the most common questions people have about tribal governments and what empowers them. First of all, it's important to establish this little-known fact. In addition to being members of ethnic minority groups, American Indian individuals are also members of tribes, and Indian tribes are political groups ruled by their own government. Because so many people don't have a background in Indian history, Indian policy, we're not taught this in, at this, you know, in our high schools or even college courses. Indian tribes are governments. And I think even understanding that basic fact is difficult because here in the United States we have sort of a, an ethnic group model, an immigrant model. We have you know, this idea of different you know, African Americans, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, and then we hear Native Americans and we sort of think in those terms. Um, but American Indian people, American Indian tribes are governments. As a matter of fact, Tribal governments are one of the four types of federally recognized governments in the United States. These are city governments, county governments, state governments, and tribal governments. American Indians are unique in that they have dual citizenship, both as citizens of the United States and as citizens of their own tribes. And as this continent's first inhabitants, American Indians are unique in other ways as well. Well, American Indians are the original people of this land. You know, we know from archaeological evidence that American Indians have been here at least 13,000 years in North America and perhaps even longer. And the tribes that exist today are descended from those first people that have been here over the millennia. From the beginning of contact with European immigrants, Indian tribes were considered to be nations, nations that exercised sovereignty. France, England, and other European nations entered into treaties with Indian nations. So, while individual Indians are mostly like everybody else in the country, they are also citizens of pre-existing tribal nations. And those nations have certain powers and rights recognized by the U.S. Constitution and the Supreme Court. So American Indians are considered to be pre-existing peoples ruled by their own governments, which qualifies them to be called nations. Legitimate governments rule on the basis of their sovereignty. So what is sovereignty and how does this concept relate to tribes? Sovereignty is the internationally recognized power of a nation to govern itself. And Indian tribes existed as sovereign governments long before Europeans settled here. Treaties between European powers and later the United States formalized a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between these powers and Indian tribes. Even the U.S. Constitution recognizes Indian tribes as distinct governments. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution specifies that Congress shall regulate commerce with and enter into treaties with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. By making treaties with the U.S., Indians gave up certain rights in exchange for promises from the federal government. These promises included the right to education and health care, hunting and fishing rights, the rights to live on land called reservations, and others. Trust responsibility is the term used to describe the government's obligation to honor these promises, which boil down to a promise to protect the best interests of the tribes and their members forever.
During the 1800s, the rights of individual Indians and their governments were put to the test in the U.S. legal system. Three Supreme Court decisions from that time period serve as a cornerstone for understanding the sovereign status of Indian nations. Johnson versus McIntosh concerned the validity of a tribal land grant made to private individuals. In this case, the court ruled that tribal rights to sovereignty had been impaired by colonization but not disregarded and held that the federal government alone has the right to negotiate for American Indian land. In the case known as the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the Cherokee tribe of Indians sued the state of Georgia because that state had assumed powers it didn't have when it seized tribal lands. The decision in this case described Indian tribes as domestic dependent nations and maintained that the federal tribal relationship resembles that of a ward to his guardian. The Worcester versus Georgia case concerned the application of Georgia state law within the Cherokee Nation. This Supreme Court decision established three things. Tribes did not lose their sovereign powers by becoming subject to the power of the United States. Only Congress has plenary or overriding power over Indian affairs, and state laws do not apply in Indian country. The powers and rights discussed here only apply to federally recognized tribes. Many groups and subgroups of Indians exist in the U.S. boundaries, but not all have established their own independent relationship to the federal government, which maintains a specific set of criteria used to determine if a tribe falls into the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. The federal recognition application is a grueling process that can take from 10 to 20 years to achieve. As of 2007, there were approximately 550 federally recognized Indian tribes in the U.S. Over the years, Congress has passed numerous laws that have modified the powers of tribes and further defined their nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. The first came in 1934, when Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act. This law reversed trends that had been set in motion in the 1890s that progressively stripped tribes of their rights to self-government and self-management of local assets. The Indian Reorganization Act, known as the IRA, established standardized tribal political structures for tribes that wished to deal with the federal government, creating the elected tribal council structure, which is still employed by many tribes today. The Indian Self-Determination Act of 1975 made it possible for many tribes to become more self-governing by contracting with the federal government to run their own health care and social service programs. These programs have to meet certain standards and requirements in order to remain under control of the tribe. In 1978, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act, which established procedures state agencies and courts must follow in handling Indian child custody matters. The law created dual jurisdiction between states and tribes that differs heavily to tribal governments. Without a doubt, Indian gaming has sparked more controversy and created greater awareness about tribal sovereignty in the general public than any other Native American related topic in recent years. Issues related to Indian gaming will be more easily understood now that we've examined tribal sovereignty. So let's delve more deeply into this area. If a tribe decides to engage in casino gaming, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, or IGRA, controls these operations and requires that state governments must negotiate in good faith with tribes to form a compact or agreement that sets forth allowable games, limits, and other terms. Indian tribes are not casino owners, primarily. So what they, what they therefore do with the casino revenue is very, very different than what 
the CEO of, of a big casino in Las Vegas or New Jersey or other commercial industry um, area states would do with the, with the money. Um, what they use the revenue for are, is to run their government. Um, and what, what do governments do? They take care of the health of their community through health centers, Indian health centers. They build schools and provide scholarships for higher education for their students. So I think that members of the general public, I think it's important for them to understand what the revenue is used for. When it comes to managing tribal casinos, each tribe operates its own gaming enterprise in a way that works best for them. Some manage their gaming property themselves, while others contract with outside management or gaming corporations to manage their casinos. In any case, the tribe always makes the final decisions. Law enforcement agencies from local sheriffs all the way up to the FBI have investigated allegations that Indian gaming is a magnet for the mob or is run by shady characters from Jersey or Vegas. In every case, no links to organized crime were ever found. The Department of Justice has even stated that there is no evidence of any kind that organized crime has anything to do with Indian casinos. Indian gaming is subject to more stringent regulation and security controls than any other type of gaming in the United States. IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, sets out the procedures and levels of this regulation. The first level is the tribal level. Each tribe has its own independent tribal gaming commission to watch over operations within their tribe. The next level is state through what's known as the Tribal State Compacts. Finally, there is federal regulation through the National Indian Gaming Commission and federal agencies such as the Department of Justice, the Treasury Department, and the Department of the Interior. It goes back to the beginning of time when Indian people hold each other accountable and we have a real strong ability to do that. So in the bottom line is we have to be accountable to our membership and our membership demands accountability and integrity. When it comes to money, people seem to have a lot of questions like, do Indians pay taxes? Individual Indian people pay all taxes required by state and federal laws. Individual Indians pay federal income tax, Social Security, and FICA, as well as state income taxes. However, since it is illegal for one government to tax another, Indian tribal governments do not pay taxes to state governments or the federal government. Tribes do pay a percentage of casino revenues to the state as specified in tribal state compacts, and that amount varies from state to state. It is important to understand that only about one-third of tribes in the U.S. have any form of gaming, and the success of these operations varies widely. In fact, only 20 tribal casinos account for more than 50% of all Indian gaming revenues. In summary, we can say that the U.S. government recognizes American Indian tribes as domestic sovereign nations that possess self-government. Tribes have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the U.S. federal government, and state governments generally do not have powers within reservations. For more information about any of the topics discussed in this program, visit your local library or take a trip to the Indian reservation nearest you. Thank you. Okay.